Hi everyone, I'm Lewis Bolden and this is Solutionaries. Today we are talking trash. Some say it is the biggest global problem that no one is talking about. And in the United States, we certainly contribute our fair share. Experts say the average American creates about four pounds of trash per day and up to 56 tons of trash per year. The United States makes up about 5% of the world's population, but contributes about 40% of the global waste, according to experts. And dealing with trash can be a huge undertaking. Think about it. How much plastic do you use every day? every month, every year. Now, how much plastic do you think you used every day for the last two years? All the masks, the filters, the plastic packaging for at-home tests, and all of the packaging to get that delivered. A recent study found that the average American's use of single-use plastic exploded during the pandemic. Estimates are still coming in because we're still in a pandemic, but a recent study found that three and a half million metric tons of masks alone were used. That's enough to get back and forth to the moon laid end to end four and a half times. And then of course there's all that takeout, the styrofoam Tupperware, the little plastic forks and little plastic bags. On average, Americans use about 110 pounds of single-use plastic every year, which is a lot when you think about how little these weigh. And that demand jumped another 5% over the pandemic. According to industry estimates, it's expected to keep rising by about that same amount every year for the next couple of years as our pandemic lives become our normal lives. All this is to say we used a lot of plastic over the last two years because it's how we stayed safe, but it's never too late to think about how much we're actually using. Go into any store right now and buy pretty much anything and you'll find packaging that looks like this, or this, or this, shrink wrapped, sealed and stored, all in plastic. And the one thing all these have in common isn't that it just seems like overkill to put all this packaging around products, it's that most of it can never be recycled. But why did we start using this in the first place? Pretty much since humans have been making stuff, we've been making things to put that stuff in. Known in the packaging industry as flexible packaging, the first recorded pieces of packaging date back to ancient China in the 1st or 2nd century BC. Sheets of bark were treated and used to wrap foods. As time went on, obviously companies experimented with and still use what's known as rigid packaging, like glass or metal. I mean, Coke bottles are still iconic. But plastics have dominated the last 70 years. Plastics take the stage at an international exhibit in Amsterdam. Plastics were originally off limits to consumers. The first plastics with names like styrene, vinyl chloride, and celluloid were developed in the late 1800s and were meant only for military use. The horizons of plastic are lengthening and strengthening too. The first flexible plastic was celluloid acetate, and it was made from wood pulp, literally using cellulose, the sturdy but flexible fibers that give plants their strength and shape. The first were made in 1900 and initially used for photography around 1909. It also had the advantage of being slightly breathable and totally biodegradable, but it was expensive to produce. So between 1910 and the 1950s, a new domain of man's own creation, companies experimented with all sorts of flexible fibrous plastics with names like propylene, polyethylene, and polyethylene terephthalate, or PEAT. Here it is, the most amazing food wrap ever developed. Which becomes the most used plastic by the 1980s. And people were excited about these new plastics. I mean, really excited. Just look at this video from Dow Chemical that I think was made for high schoolers or something. Chemistry needn't be a drag. Just take another look, it could be your bag. Anyway, all of those have a few things in common that made them great choices for packaging. For starters, they're non-breathable, so they can keep food fresher for longer. They're generally clear, so consumers can actually see what they're buying. And maybe the biggest advantage? They're just cheaper to make than other plastics. 
With the rise of e-commerce in the last 20 years, flexible plastic has become the most efficient way to ship things we buy. One study found Amazon produced 465 million pounds of plastic waste in 2019 alone. That's enough to make those air-filled packaging pillows that come in the boxes and circle the earth 500 times. Plastic waste has also become a huge environmental and health problem. In the United States Great Lakes, researchers found that 10,000 metric tons or about 22 million pounds of plastic waste ends up in the ecosystem of our largest bodies of fresh water. And in the ocean, 80% of the litter is plastic. And it never breaks down, creating what's called microplastics, which end up in the food chain and eventually in us. Just this year, scientists found microplastics, these microscopic pieces of plastic that get made when plastic pollution is ground down over time, in human blood. The thing is, we know this, and we've known most of it for a long time, but we are really bad at recycling, and not just sort of bad, but really bad. Since the 1950s, only 2% of all the world's plastic has been recycled. But there are people working at the most local levels to try to fix that. Which is why we came here, a place literally called Recycle Here, to talk to one of them. We um, started with our youth and we've grown to now work with businesses and we work with the community on the Detroit Recycles curbside recycling program. Natalie Jacob is the executive director of Green Living Science. She helps teach kids about trash and recycling in Detroit, where the city deals with millions of pounds of litter each year. In 2018 alone, Detroit's Department of Public Works collected 92 million pounds of trash from illegal dumping sites around the city. People like Natalie have been instrumental in getting recycling into Detroit public schools and apartment buildings downtown, including the one I live in, which I didn't know until we talked. Their lessons are meant to teach kids about recycling, why it's important, and how they can start recycling. For the education to be impactful, we have to have some scare factor in there, so we do let them know um, the negative impacts plastic has um, you know, on the animals. We've, in some cases, we have shown them pictures. It, it breaks their heart to see it, it breaks our hearts to see it. Um, and so we do have some element of that, but we do focus a lot more on here's what you can do and here's why it's important. But at the local level, getting kids to think about recycling can create a lifelong habit and one that trickles up to their parents. Kids get it. Uh, kids get it more than their parents do. One of the things we hear the most is that um, the reason that a family is here is because of their, their child. So they learned about it in school, they made their families recycle, and they wanted to come here. But it's only part of the solution. Well, all of this is great, and it helps on the small level to clean up our neighborhoods and cities. Solving the problems of plastics is not something that we can crush our way out of. It's going to take real change at the biggest levels. And that's where the work of researchers like Michigan State's Dr. Mohamed Rabnawaz come in. Plastic recycling is a big problem. Literally speaking today, 40% of the plastic that is produced, it goes into the packaging. And packaging essentially is creating almost 50% of the plastic waste. Dr. Rabnawaz works on developing new kinds of packaging that's more biodegradable and can help reduce waste. But even he would say it's just as much about getting companies to start using better packaging as it is about design. Which is why he says the solution to this problem is to give big companies incentives to change their packaging or tax them for using environmentally unfriendly plastic, sort of a stick and carrot for corporations. If you are using virgin material like new plastic in the package, you need to pay a penalty, extra tax. And the carrot is for the companies, if you are putting more recycled content, you get tax incentive. So basically giving them both options, you want to go this way or that way, uh, you will have the benefits if you move forward with the recycling. And he says that stick and carrot method has already been shown to work. In the European Union, for example, companies are forced to pay up front for the cost of the plastics they use that can't be recycled, which means now 40% of their plastics get recycled. In the US, we don't have that system, it's just 9%. But it is an uphill battle. Companies at every level of the plastic and packaging industries have spent decades fueling research and funding campaigns to keep non-recyclable plastics on the market. And it's worked. Not to mention, they've used that same research to put the cost of finding ways to recycle on the consumer, on us, rather than on themselves. It's not easy because 
you are competing against the low cost material like polyethylene, right? Which is so cheap, but we cannot go with the practices that what we do here. So eventually it will be a combination of something like a bio-based material, which essentially are biodegradable. There's one aspect and then reducing the creation of the new plastic by adding more and more recycled content into the packaging. So those are the two things that I see like should go together. Plastics and plastic packaging is a really complicated problem with complicated solutions. But maybe that's just it. If we start with solutions big and small, we can end up boxing this problem in, maybe for good. There are more than 126,000 workers who pick up garbage and recyclables from neighborhoods and businesses across the country. But these five states, California, Florida, Texas, New York, and Ohio, have the highest employment levels in that industry. In 2021, New York offered the highest average hourly wage at $30. That's actually the highest hourly wage in the country. The hourly wage in Texas averages just shy of $17, in 2021 anyway. The labor shortage across many industries is driving the competitive market. It's in favor of employees right now. Companies are using big signing bonuses to pull in workers, as well as higher starting wages. The city of Houston is offering a signing bonus, but says they're competing with others who offer a starting pay at $25 or more. The city of Houston's starting pay is around $19. We've told the city to uh, come out and pick up this trash. We really just want the trash to be picked up. Should it be that hard to get your trash picked up? I don't think so. Do you have enough people to do that job effectively? Uh, we are currently getting there. We currently don't. My name is Mark Wolfall, and I'm the Solid Waste Director for the City of Houston. Solid Waste Management is a competitive business. How many drivers are you short right now? Uh, at, based on what we're seeing right now, we currently have about 50 vacancies. It means that at times services might get compromised. It's not that they won't be provided, but it may not be as scheduled. No, they can't function without us because we have to, it's a federal law that we have to pick up garbage. My name is Sine Stanberry Roberts. I'm an operator with the City of Houston Solid Waste Department. The city is growing more day by day, so as the city grow, we're not getting the manpower, the personnel that we need. And a lot of people, you know, went to trucking companies because they were offering more money. The thing about the garbage truck drivers is they get their license and they decide they want to be over the road truckers or something, and that's the route they might take because of the the higher pay and different benefits and things. I'm Jimmy Monk. I'm the CDL coordinator slash instructor here at Alvin Community College. A garbage truck is just a class B with no trailer. They improve their ability by becoming a class A driver and the money is all over the road. There's a sign on 59, uh, a company out of Austin's offering $8,000 retention bonuses. It's definitely an employee's market uh, right now. My name's Matthew May. Uh, my brother and I are the owners of a residential trash and recycle collection company, uh, Best Trash. We've had some trouble with uh, employee uh, retention with uh, the market, the more uh, competitive it gets for employees, the, the harder it is to retain them. We're definitely competitive. 
and uh, with, got to be. with our insurance, health insurance, and we do uh, an employee loan program. Uh, at any time, we probably have fifty to seventy thousand dollars out in employee loans. We're currently doing a market rate study right now, right, and we see where some of our our counterparts in the industry may be paying twenty-five or twenty-six dollars an hour, that's and that's a big fine. gap. That's a big gap, but the schedule, the work schedule that we have. You actually have time with your family. I do know that there are some opportunities uh, for improvement. And, and, and one good thing about that is that our residents will see the difference. From a scale to one to 10, I like my job at nine. I would bring like plastic water bottles like every day almost. You don't think about it. It's just a habit. I played softball my whole life, so yeah, I definitely use Gatorade bottles, single-use plastic water bottles all the time. Plastic as we know it first surfaced in the 1950s, made from petroleum. It's cheap and convenient. Since then, factories have produced 9.1 billion tons of it. Now humans use 1.2 million plastic bottles per minute. Americans buy 50 billion water bottles each year, and approximately 91% of plastic is not recycled. 14 million tons of plastic ends up in our oceans each year. The plastics that make it to the landfill break down into tiny toxic chemicals, which leak into the environment. Studies have also linked plastics to health problems, from birth defects to cancer. My name's Morgan Eaton. Um, I've been a volunteer with Beaches Will Green for just over a year now. We are an environmental nonprofit. Our goal is to basically eliminate single-use plastic, but mainly to educate the youth. Beaches Go Green has partnered with seven North Florida schools, creating clubs and giving out free reusable water bottles, starting with student athletes. This is Fletcher Middle School. It's just outside of Jacksonville, Florida, and it happens to be right across the street from the beach. That's one reason why administrators say it hasn't been that hard to change kids' minds about plastic. These are our Beaches Go Green water bottles. Um, this is the club, obviously, our school and our sponsor. I just like how like everyone customized them. What do you tell your classmates? I tell them, like, instead of using, like, a plastic water bottle, they should get one because it's way better and it protects the environment way more. Swim team is getting water bottles. We just got a sponsor. They're going to make them. It's awesome. I'm Joe McKenzie. I am the principal here at Fletcher Middle School. This represents the amount of water bottles we would use in a year if we did not have a reusable One. Bottle. One bottle takes care of all that. One bottle. Per year. One reusable bottle replaces 156 plastic bottles. Beaches Go Green has given out 12,000 so far. They cost about $11 each. Most of that is paid for by sponsors, who in turn get their logo on the bottle. I'm Veronica Schaff, and I'm one of the presidents of Beaches Go Green Club okay. at school. Mm -hmm. I'm Taylor Brown and I am a junior and I am also co-president of the Pontiac High School Beaches Go Green Club. We tell our athletes when we distribute the bottles that plastic is non-biodegradable so every single piece of plastic that was ever created is still here and will always be here on earth so that plastic will never ever go away which is why it's really good to reuse. <laughs> Beaches Go Green is working on more sponsors and more schools. The hope is for every student to get a bottle and a lesson for free. It's to try to eliminate as much single-use plastic as we can, to influence them to influence their children and their children and their grandchildren, great-grandchildren, future generations to just stop leaving their print on the earth in a negative way such as single-use plastics. Saving the world one sip at a time.
Trash in our waterways is also a problem. Plastic bottles, plastic bags, basically anything that's man-made that's not supposed to be there is considered marine debris. Sometimes you can see the debris just walking along the beach. Other times the debris is so small you can barely see it in the water. These are often referred to as microplastics. Right now, there is a new push to clean up these microplastics, and there is research that suggests that these plastics can even end up in our bodies. That's according to John Peterson with SeaWorld. Solutionaries correspondent Eric Sandoval has more. We're on our way to Cocoa Beach, Florida today, which is located in Brevard County, just east of Orlando. It's really one of the top tourist beach destinations in the state. A lot of tourists love it, spring breakers, locals, myself included. And it's because all those people love to go there that they've really struggled with the garbage and the trash that's left out on the sand. We're going to check out an experimental technique that they've deployed that they say has the potential to make beach cleanup a little more efficient. The president keep forward to be if I'll reach out and they're like, hey, uh, you want a robot? I'm like, yes, I want a robot. So a couple weeks later, it showed up. My name is Brian Bobbitt, executive director of Keeper Vard Beautiful. This is my home. I want to make sure it's clean. Uh, you know, we see two people that are here with their families. No one wants to have trash out on their beach. So this is why I do what we do. This is Bebot. It uh, cleans the beach. So Bebot is a solar powered and electric uh, uh, robot that will actually sift through the sand and remove all the microplastics and sift everything out. It doesn't take long to fill up this tray full of stuff. We're constantly picking up trash out here, and you guys do an awesome job. Oh, we appreciate it. Uh, plastic bag, uh, several bottle caps, uh, sticker to a Star Wars thing, straw. Cigarette butt. Yep, cigarette butt, plastic fork handle, um, a dental pick. Ew. Is it like autonomous? It has to be controlled by a human. Just walk behind it, keep it slowly moving forward. And as you can imagine, you want to come see it? A robot on the beach drew attention. I thought you guys were cleaning the beach, but then I also thought maybe, are they testing something lunar? That seems strange. I, my brain, my mind was just um, whirling as to what this could be. And then I'm, I saw cleaner, so I'm like, I'm going to go ask them. I'm not disrupting a NASA project. <laughs> <laughs> so I can control the, the pitch, the depth. Bobbitt says his volunteers still collect garbage here by hand. In fact, they collected more than 145 tons of it in one year alone. But it's the tiny pieces that Bebot is able to pick up that could be a game changer. What is that? That is a microplastic. So it was a piece of something bigger, maybe a Frisbee or a beach toy or, or whatever. Um, you know, it gets left out here on the sand. It gets uh, sunbaked, breaks down and eventually goes into smaller, smaller pieces. So that is the definition of a microplastic. Um, now the problem is that stuff can end up in the water. Mm -hmm. Fish eat it, turtles eat it, other wildlife eat it. We eat the fish. I was gonna say, and then we end up eating exactly. the fish and it gets in us. Exactly. So my official title is Education Coordinator at the Marine Science Center. My name's uh, Shell Webster. Mm -hmm. And Shell, short for Michelle, says garbage that makes its way into oceans and lakes can impact marine life that lives there, like sea turtles. When they're in the ocean, they're looking for food, they're holding their breath, they're diving down to go and get things like jellyfish. And then you're diving down again and you're going down for another jellyfish, but showing them that it looks like a jellyfish. It's a grocery bag. Right. And that's why this is, you know, I love the fact that you love this one. This is great. My little uh, plastic bag in the water that just looks like a jellyfish. Hi, my name is Alyssa Hancock. I am the assistant manager of sea turtle rehabilitation here at the Marine Science Center in Ponce Inlet, Florida. 
So in here, we're actually in our sea turtle hospital. And it's inside this hospital that Alyssa and her team have helped save the lives of more than 25,000 reptiles. A lot of those were sea turtles who were trapped in garbage. We've got some fishing line. Um, it gets entangled around their flippers as well as around their necks. So Ghoul was one that we actually found uh, plastics in his uh, GI tract. So all of this actually came from one turtle. So unfortunately, we do see this a lot with these guys. Um, and I don't know if you can tell, but it's actually really hard plastics mm -hmm. so the problem with that is if it's going through his gut it's actually going to cause lacerations yeah. um, and issues with his gut as well if they're eating seagrass or anything on the bottom of the ocean you get that plastic down there as well that has to be heartbreaking to see it's really hard um, especially when we've worked with a patient so long and then unfortunately um, if they pass away due to plastic ingestion or um, if we find it later on it's it's really tough for us how yeah. do you get through that um, <laughs> kind of just have to focus on the ones that we can release and the ones that we can help and know that, you know, we're trying our best for all these animals. Oh, that sounds so easy, yeah. though. I mean, it's not that easy, is it's it? It's not, no, unfortunately, <laughs> but, you know, we just have to focus on the good. We would really like people to focus on uh, lowering their plastic use. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we try not to um, use water bottles. We try to use reusable mm -hmm. water bottles. Um, don't use plastic bags. So if you have reusable bags um, for shopping, mm -hmm. that can really help as well. But until more people latch on to that idea, Bobbitt says bee bots like this will eventually be cleaning 30 beaches across the state of Florida. This thing is just the start. Like I said, it's the first of its kind in the country. And we're very honored to have the opportunity to be able to test it out. But as we work on it more and we kind of figure out and work out some of the kinks, uh, I think we're gonna see more and more of these types of machines all along the beach roadways. I think this is kind of a way of the future, um, but we're always going to have to have humans do the right thing first. Center is a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, it's a nature center that focuses on hands-on feet wet opportunities for um, education, exploration, and conservation. We just want people to have accessibility to the environment and we want people to understand that our natural resources are invaluable. I'm Tess Taylor Tynes. I'm the conservation science coordinator at the Marine Discovery Center. This was a high school track and field, um, which as you can imagine, wasn't really being used by a lot of fish or birds. Five acres that used to be kind of non-functional for wildlife is now really a nursery for wildlife. So, you know, in addition to the, all the marine life that, that's probably out here, you probably also see a lot of junk and trash. Yes, yes. So tell me about some of the things you've seen. Um, you know, commonly we find items like bottles and bottle caps that may have flown off someone's boat as they were driving by. Um, we find plastic bags, um, fishing line is left behind a lot of the time. So the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project started out of the IFAS extension of University of Florida. Okay, I'm going to be uh, collecting a water sample from the kayak launch. Ed Loomis has been involved really, really strongly through microplastics since the beginning of our involvement with the studies. I have orthotics inside that are fairly new and I don't want to destroy them. Citizen science is a huge part of the mission at Marine Discovery Center. It's a one liter bottle. And the whole idea behind citizen science is that we can have people from the public getting involved at a scientific level without having to go through the labs or the master's programs or what have you. And we always take the sample from the surface of the water. 
And this is the sample we'll be analyzing. I think using citizens allows us to not only gain a better perspective through that data, but they can also educate others around them. So it's quite literally a ripple effect. Back to the laboratory to uh, see what we just collected. It's a little lighter than coffee. <laughs> it might be green tea, maybe. So when you're done with this, you're going to take the filter and then put it underneath right. the microscope to right. see. I'm looking at every little square on that filter. Anything that might resemble a plastic, a film, or a fiber. I just love the outdoors. I just love everything about nature. And, uh, and it's just, I've been that way since I was 11 years old. <laughs> now I'm 79. <laughs> Volunteers, especially ones like Ed, are completely invaluable. There's, there, it's almost indescribable how important they are to us. It keeps me young and it's wonderful working with young people. So this is a cooler full of archive samples from our last project. We have a, a three letter site code uh, from where the sample site was taken. I could probably fill a storage unit full of them if I really wanted to. <laughs> My thoughts are that it's pretty inevitable at this point. Um, but those little petri dishes are, are like little things of hope for me. Um, this allows us to gain a, a better understanding of this environmental issue in our local area so that we can tackle it in the future. Somebody's cast net. And someone like Ed can say, I'm part of the solution and that I'm pr providing data. Yeah, I see a lot of hope in the work that we've done. Recycling can be confusing. Where you live determines what can be recycled. For example, in Salem, you drop off your recycling in a big bin that everyone dumps stuff into. These centers accept cardboard, plastics one and two, aluminum cans and bimetal, and paper, but they do not accept glass. But in Roanoke, each house has their own bin, and the city comes to pick it up every other week. Roanoke City takes everything we just mentioned and glass, so it's important to check where you live and what they recycle. And if you move, check again. Here's the big thing. Plastic bags like you get from the grocery store cannot be recycled. Plastic bags and the film that comes around a case of water are the biggest recycling headaches when it comes to sorting all of it. They tear, slow down conveyor belts during processing, and clog up the machines at the recycling facility. It can mean big money to fix those machines. Take those back to the grocery store and look for the place to recycle them. Recycling right can save everyone a lot of headaches and taxpayer money. I take pride in my community. I think it's important for everyone in a community to take pride in their community. I care about my environment and I care about the critters that live in it. Well, recycling reduces the amount of waste that we end up having to put into the landfill. I think it's important for people to understand that they're also part of the solution to the problem. When you look at all this, what do you see? Money. 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a businessman. I'm, my goal here is, you know, as a manager, uh, all goals are to maximize shareholder profit. But I look at how much, uh, how much return we can get to cover our expenses and maybe put a little bit in the bank. I'm Billy Basham, Director of Facilities, Roanoke Market. When you recycle, you want to do the right thing. Absolutely. But you have to recycle right. Absolutely. Or what happens? The key to the whole process is to only recycle what is recyclable in your community. One of the biggest challenges we have is good, clean material in a bag tied up. So why is this a problem for us? Well, if, if we don't open this bag from the beginning, before we load it under our system, the bag is just going to go through the system and everything in it is going to become invaluable because it's, it's encapsulated in a bag. So, so what do you want people to do when they drop people, off recycling? When they, all right, let's, that's a very good question. I think I can demonstrate that. When they carry their recycling to the recycling center in this bag, dump this into the container and put this in the trash. You know, everybody thinks it's plastic and it's, it's got a recycling label on it so I can recycle it. So I would like for them to think about the items that we are able to have recycled locally. The number ones and two plastics, aluminum cans, bimetal cans, cardboard and newspaper and mixed paper. And then everything else is considered municipal solid waste or garbage. We found tires, rocks, dirt. You couldn't imagine how many pounds of hair extensions we pull out every day, diapers, soiled diapers. When somebody does not recycle right, what does that mean for a city? So for a city, it, it, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost the taxpayer. We're going to have to pay a higher rate to have that debris removed from what's supposed to be recycled. And so it just drives up the cost for everybody. All localities have to meet a 25% minimum recycling. So you take all your garbage that you haul to the to the landfill you divide that by 25 percent and, and, you, and your locality has to recycle a minimum of 25 percent every year i've turned in a report that that i have to list all the all the tons of plastics aluminums oil antifreeze tires batteries what happens if you don't hit that 25 percent I never had to go there before. <laughs> when people know what to recycle, it makes recycling cleaner, right? Absolutely. My goal is to process 80 tons a day. The stuff that, that I and, and my customers find value in, then at the end of the day, I've got 80 tons of material that I can sell. That's, that's just not the reality. I'll have 40, 50 tons of material I can sell and 30 tons of material I need to take to the landfill. Recycling reduces the amount of waste that we end up having to put into the landfill. Landfill construction is very expensive. My name is Dan Miles. I'm the CEO for the Roanoke Valley Resource Park. The cell that we're standing on right now is about an 11 acre cell and it costs about eight and a half million dollars to build. And then you've got all of your operating expenses and everything else that's, that goes along with it. Any ton of recyclable that we can keep from coming to the landfill will be one less ton that will use the life expectancy prematurely. So do you think recycling is still worth it? Well, I think that recycling is worth it, just from a standpoint of the big picture. And you look at it and say, it is the right thing to do. But I think there's also some things that have to be done on the front end of recycling, that from a marketing standpoint, that if you look at uh, the way our products are manufactured, some things can be done from a manufacturing standpoint that would reduce the amount of materials that would come to the landfill. But after the fact, I think it's important for people to understand that they're also part of the solution to the problem. They are participants in generating the amount of garbage that comes and fills up this space. 
And it's a finite amount of space. It's not infinite. I firmly believe that people want to do the right thing. I just don't think there's enough continuous education. I think everybody wants a recycle program, but 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 the responsibilities of a of a good recycling program is continuous education. My husband calls me a trashy lady. <laughs> I'm Mary Dolan and I volunteer to pick up trash in the city of Sewood. We've lived here for two years and I think you should care about the community that you live in. It makes it for a better place, you know, so um, I just volunteer my time and then bring the recyclables to the recycling center and throw the trash in the trash. Everybody just has a different way of volunteering and when there's more volunteers in a community, you have a better community, so I think that's why I do it. Volunteers from numerous caving organizations regularly gear up and enter caves and sinkholes to clean them. Some can be walked into. Now you can take your left hand off the rope and feed off on the hand as you go over these lips. Others require rappelling down. So this is basically an extension of the cave. So we came down this 40 foot drop, maybe 45 foot drop. And um, the cave keeps on continuing down the slope here. And the cave, it was used as a trash dump for many years. And some of the trash that has come up here ended up being washed down down there because the cave takes water um, and it just gets carried away. A lot of the rainwater, you know, washes into these caves and then eventually get to our, you know, drinking water eventually. So we want, uh, we don't want the, all the trash to be the part of the filtration system. Water will flow through cracks in the rock into Edwards Aquifer, recharging San Antonio's water supply. But keeping the caves clean is a must because this could contaminate the water. Of course, some of the other industrial materials that we have, you know, car batteries, lead batteries we've seen, radiators, we've seen car parts, et cetera, that have been thrown in these uh, caves and that. And they sit there and they slowly release, you know, the material over time. And if you have enough of those uh, uh, sinkholes that have been used for disposal of material, you can result in localized groundwater contamination problems. Some of them had like like gasoline or gas. So those are really, you know, like toxic, toxic waste. This is one of the messiest rooms in the cave. You can see all the trash here, all the different clutter, glass bottles, tin cans. You'll find some random items like this. This, this appears to be a toy cash register. Then you also have more hazardous things that our water actually filters through before going into Edwards Aquifer. And this right here is toilet bowl cleaner. It actually has danger and poison on it. Ranch dumps have been used for many, many years uh, for disposal of basically ranch waste. And that before people really understood or, or the relationship between the activities on the surface and our water resources. Just your initial thoughts when you see so much debris and waste uh, in some of these caves. You know, it's, it, 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 it kind of makes me sad in a way, but it's also understandable. I mean, given that this ha occurred so long ago, you know, the owners tell us that, um, you know, that nobody's used this as, you know, for trash in, in you know, I, I want to say like 50 years or so. We rigged that tree and we have a little hole system to pull up the actual buckets, but then we also have that rope system for people to safely go down. How much yes. trash do you think you've already taken out and how much more do you hope to be able to pull out? Hundreds of pounds of trash. Yeah, it's, it's quite over, um, amazing how actually there is one wall where all the crumbled up tin cans are like almost wedged in and have become part of the wall. There's certainly uh, a lot of trash that we just can't get to, we can't physically remove, it's too difficult or actually too dangerous for the, uh, the, the volunteers who are down there handling broken glass and sharp metal and, and sharp wire and that, and it falls and rolls down into crevices that we just can't reach. Edwards Aquifer is San Antonio's main source of drinking water. Currently, it's sitting at excellent for water quality. This trash has been there for 100 years, and we still have pretty good uh, water. What's the point of getting that trash out now, or what's the benefits to it? Well, it's not always clear how quickly these contaminants will move through the system. 
And as the uh, waste is there, it continues to degrade and will continue to release material. Removing trash has certainly helped improve water quality on a local basis. And that, but it's very difficult to quantify because uh, we don't always have um, nearby monitoring points that we can actually uh, do a before and after a sample of water quality. What are the signs to you that show, hey, this is definitely working. We are actually doing something good and bettering the water quality. Well, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, an improvement, I think, in removing the trash in that related to the habitat of individual caves. And you compound that with many, many caves that have been uh, cleaned up. And uh, we, we think it'll have a positive impact on the aquifer. A vision so beautiful, slowly being destroyed. I just find it a win, win, win. Along the coast of Florida, inside a retirement home in Sarasota, these women are doing what they can. We're keeping this out of the environment, the poor fish in the sea and all. We're giving us something to do, to feel good about, and then the homeless. How did all of this start? I was looking in Facebook and I saw these women from Ohio in a church, separate tables, one table cutting up the bags, the next one, you know, looping them and crocheting them, and then actually going out and handing it to a homeless person. Over the last five years, Michelle Penn has turned the plastic bags you get at the store every day into more than two hundred of these mats. Saves the environment because we have so many bags, five to six hundred in one mat, and it keeps the homeless off the street, off the hard street. That's more than a hundred and twenty thousand of these plastic bags being used for good instead of ending up in the trash. Still only a minor dent when you consider a hundred and sixty thousand plastic bags are used every second. But Michelle's idea is growing. The mat's now a community project. People giving so many plastic bags to Michelle, she started teaching others her skill. We're the loopers, <laughs> and then we roll up and make balls. Like an assembly line, everyone has a role at the assisted living facility at the Bay Villages. I guess we retired people don't really have a super whole lot to do, and I am in a motor chair, so I can't get around much, but I sure can do this. The women meet once a week for an hour. How great is this? You get to sit here for like an hour? Yes. And chit chat. Chit chat. Gossip. <laughs> but these mats are time consuming. First of all, they're over there cutting them, the bags and trimming them. Then they make this, which she told you was plarn. It's poly yarn. That's how it got the name. And then we roll it up into balls. Mm -hmm. And then we, then we start crocheting. So how long does it take you to do this? I can't give you any time frame because I don't do it that often. And also hard on the joints. I'm about pa paralyzed now. <laughs> but the work rarely stops. We are moving in a grooving over here. Knowing each bag, loop, and eventually mat serves a greater purpose. It's kind of thrilling for me to watch them accept these things. They're so pleased. After a dozen or so mats are made, the women take a field trip, personally handing them out. I couldn't go because I knew I would cry. Oh, well, it was hard for you. Yeah, I'm very sensitive and I knew I would cry. I mean, because we have so much and they have so little, it's just heartbreaking. Which is why through the pain and many hours, the work gets done for moments like this. We met this woman who says she's been homeless for the last couple of years. So you don't have to lie on the ground. Yes. That's what I'm looking at. Right, Publix. I see. <laughs> Walgreens. Amazed by the intricate detail that goes into one of these mats. What does this mean to you? It means that I got something to sleep on and be comfortable. And it was joyful to get this. Because I wouldn't have been here. I was just about to go catch the bus, and I'm so happy that I stayed to get me something to sleep on comfortable. Some things don't come to you. No, they don't. 
some don't come, but the blessings do. A true win, win, win for everybody involved. We'd like to hear what you think about the topic. Leave us a comment below and be sure to subscribe to our Solutionaries channel. We're just getting started.